presence. Thank you for the work you've done on our behalf that because of you we can live, we can thrive. We thank you that because of you we have hope, we have peace, we have confidence in this life. Father, I pray that as we look into your word, our hearts would be flooded with light, that the same spirit that inspired the writing of your word would inspire our understandings, that we would be fed of your word, strengthened by you, equipped by you, enlightened, encouraged. Thank you, Father, for your spirit. Now, you know where each of us are in our lives, our hearts and minds. I pray that you minister to each one accordingly and thank you for it in advance. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you again for being here. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to talk about uh, baptism today and uh, being that we're going to do it. And uh, last week was uh, we received communion and we taught on communion. Uh, But, you know, uh, I think it's important that we have some understanding about why we do stuff, you know. And uh, very often we do things just because it's uh, tradition or habit. But actually, the Bible teaches on baptism, and there's no shortage of arguments about baptism, you know. And uh, it's all different kinds. How do you do it? Where do you do it? Do you dunk them? Do you sprinkle them? Do you splash them? What constitutes, you know? But the Bible has these answers, and so we're going to look into God's Word today and uh, see a few of the answers. And then um, we won't stay too long. That way, uh, when we end, we can walk outside and uh, baptize some people. So, uh, all right, if you have your Bible, Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, if you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen. I'm going to move faster than probably you'll turn pages, but I always encourage people to write down the scriptures and go look at them because, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter what a person says. What matters is what the Word says. And so we really need to have the Word of God as our basis of foundation. Let that form your system of belief. And uh, that's where your most... uh, successful life in Christ will come from. But Hebrews 6, the writer of Hebrews, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word perfection just means maturity. And so it's possible to mature spiritually just like you uh, mature physically. So it wouldn't be normal for you to be as immature now as you were as a kid, right? At least not publicly. (laughs) Uh, I think we should all have a little bit of fun, but uh, he's saying that really what we want to do is leave the elementary teachings of the doctrine of Christ and move on to some maturity. So what he's getting ready to say here, he's going to list some of the elementary principles. And he says this, let us go on to perfection, maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, number one, faith toward God, number two. Doctrine, the doctrine of baptisms, number three. And he goes on to say of laying on of hands. Did you know laying on of hands is an elementary doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ? The laying on of hands, that there's many reasons that the Bible gives for laying hands on somebody. Uh, and, and something happens, right? God is not unintentional. There's a reason behind it. And uh, Jesus laid his hands on kids and blessed them. Moses laid hands on Aaron and gave honor to Aaron. Jesus laid hands and the disciples on people and they were healed. There's a doctrine of laying on of hands. It's part of the church. But uh, he says the doctrine of baptisms. Now that's interesting because it's plural, meaning that there's more than one baptism. Now most people are familiar. If you say baptism, we're thinking water, right? Water. Of some way, some form, whether you're sprinkled or however you're raised, but baptism is you and water. And so, uh, but there's actually a doctrine of baptisms in the gospel, in the Bible, and there's more than one kind of baptism. I just want to look at three today to give some distinction to what we're going to do, all right? Three different baptisms mentioned. Number one, we'll look in Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses uh, 26 through 29, and then you can mark it down. And go uh, see if I'm telling you the truth later, all right? Uh, As he says here, Paul says, For you are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So, you know, the world, the secular world says, you know, if there's a God, then we're all sons of God. But actually, the Bible says that you're a son of God through faith in Christ. 
so that, uh, you know, there's some distinction there, right? You're all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so here Paul introduces what's called a baptism into Christ or faith in Christ, which really ultimately would be uh, the new birth, that you're baptized into Christ through your faith in Christ. So Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3. He said, uh, you were born once, Nicodemus, but you must be born again. In the Greek, it means to be refathered from above. That's where the term new birth comes in. But uh, you have to be born again. Now, let's look at that word baptism, define it just a little bit. Uh, number one, it was used as uh, a secular term in biblical times for coloring fabrics. That you would color fabrics, you would, you would baptize them. And uh, how many of you ever colored fabrics before? <laughs> Man, I remember it, you know, when I was a kid, the RIT uh, little box, you know, and uh, you fill your sink up and then you, you really destroy a bunch of other stuff to get that one shirt. <laughs> and so you're toweled, everything's destroyed, the clothes you're wearing are partially died, but then at least you got that one shirt. Uh, and so what you did is you actually filled up a, a basin and you put the dye in there and you would immerse that fabric. You didn't sprinkle it, right? How many of you ever dyed a shirt by sprinkling it? No, baptism means immersion. And so you actually immerse that fabric and you soaked it until that fabric absorbed the qualities of the dye, the color of the dye, the scent of the dye, the text. All of that was absorbed into the fabric. That was a baptism. So a baptism would leave the thing baptized altered permanently. Right? In other words, that shirt's never going to be what it was. It's different now. It's changed. So actually, to define the biblical word, um, they use a, uh, an example from 200 B.C. And actually, this in the biblical definition is, uh, they, they, uh, the commentary calls it the clearest example that shows the meaning of this word. There's baptizo, and I'm not Greek. How many of you figured that out? Baptizo, and then there is also... Uh, um, uh, babto, you know, so uh, you can do what you want with the pronunciation, but I said it as I saw it. Uh, but there is, uh, it says the clear, there's a distinction between the two, and uh, the best way it's noted in those times is through the Greek poet and physician Nicander. Now, uh, he lived in around 200 BC, and it's used in reference to a pickle recipe. <laughs> How many of you like pickles? Yeah? Wow. All right. I know what we're having for our next church meal. Pickles. Only pickles. But it's a pickle recipe, so not necessarily, uh, you know, cucumber pickles, but you can pickle anything, right? And so really it's dealing with the pickling of a particular vegetable, whatever it may be. There's pickled beets and pickled onions and pickled okra and pickled uh, asparagus and there's pickled people, you know. Actually, if you just look around, there's a few, you know, you find some, not here, I'm just saying in the first service and maybe at Walmart. So uh, there's a few pickled people. But the truth of the matter is, is that through this pickling process, actually it gives one of the best examples of what it means to be baptized. And so uh, the reason that this example is used to define the biblical word is because it makes a distinction between those two words so that there's no confusion. The first word is used in dipping, so it's, it's immersion on both sides, but it's dipping the vegetable into boiling water. That's step one. Uh, the recipe will be on my Facebook page uh, later. Not really. But uh, it's pickling. You dip it in boiling water, right? You, and, but then you take it out, and ultimately it's a temporary thing. But then the word that's used for this, this word, baptized into Christ, is when you immerse the vegetable in the vinegar solution, and it produces a permanent change. 
a permanent change. In other words, they're saying that when you're baptized into Christ, you don't go down and come up one way and stay the same way. There's a permanent change. There's a lasting change through this new birth, through this baptism in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18 say it this way. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, that there's something about the blood of Jesus that will wash you from what you were and make you a new creation. Come on, all of humanity, whether they realize it or not, acknowledge it or not, there's something on the inside of them that can never be satisfied. There's that weight of, uh, of sin that is spread through all of mankind. And it's only in Christ that this is lifted. Amen. Only in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All Things have become new. It's like the pickling process. You take that vegetable and everything it used to be is gone. And everything that it is now is because of that brine or that solution. It goes on to say that in verse 18, all these things that are new are from God. So in the same way that that vegetable takes on the taste, the characteristics of what it's immersed in, the human spirit takes on the life of Christ. Amen. Amen. Man, the life of Christ. What kind of life is that? Well, it's triumphant life. It's victorious life. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that in Jesus was life and the life of was the light of men and that light shines in darkness and darkness cannot comprehend it. Doesn't mean darkness can't figure it out, that darkness is just sitting there trying to, wow, man, I can't figure this out. That word comprehend literally means overcome. That the life that's in Jesus is the solution to the death that was in Adam. And when you are baptized into Christ, you cannot stay the same. You're a new creature. Amen. You've been born again. In the Greek, you've been refathered from above. That Jesus duplicates in the believer the life of his resurrection. Amen. So well, I don't feel like it. I don't look like it. It's a spiritual impartation that has to have its outworking in your life, right? Jesus, you know, we're not supposed to judge people, right? Your whole world's big on that. We don't judge anybody. Just come as you are. But, you know, no shoes, no shirt, no service. But come as you are. And uh, so, you know, we have this whole idea. But we're not supposed to nitpick and say, well, you're wrong at this. and you're... That's not right. How many of you agree that's not right? You know what I mean? Who cares how they comb their hair? How, you know, whatever. Uh, but Jesus said you will make distinctions based upon the fruit that's produced. So that God, you, you, you have a uni you're brought into union with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, If any man be joined to the Lord, they are one spirit. That the blood of Jesus will wash you so thoroughly that you and God are united. And you can't think on that without, without it producing external change, right? So Jesus said, go ahead and look at the fruit. Look at, Jesus likes fruit, doesn't he? Judge them by the fruit. So there's going to be something in your spirit that is evidence of your union with Christ, that you've been born again. Old man's gone, new man's here, right? Uh, I heard a story one time, this old uh, cantankerous individual, you know? You ever meet a cantankerous person? How many of you sitting by him right now? You say, I don't want to smile, but they're right next to me, cantankerous. Uh, my grandpa was pretty cantankerous. He's four foot 11, so I don't know what happened, but anyhow, that's where it all stopped for him, four foot 11. But he was feisty, you know? And uh, boy, he'd get mad, and he'd, be, uh, he'd get so mad, he'd just tell you off. He'd give you a piece of his mind. He really didn't have that much to spare, you know. Uh, a lot of us do. I'll give you a piece of my mind. Well, you better save it. You, you might need it later. Uh, I'll give you a piece of my mind. And so he would give people, and then he'd tell them about Jesus. It was just really, you know, he loved the Lord, but he had some problems. And so uh, anyhow, uh, 
just, just real cantankerous. So this individual, he was kind of that way. So he would critique, he'd come to church, you know. I always just wonder when I wasn't interested in the Lord, I just didn't come to church. So it, it blew me away to find out that people still come and, and are just, you know, uh, grouchy or, or mean, you know. I was like, I, just, I was mean at home. But anyhow, so he'd come and then he'd critique and say, ah, here goes sister so-and-so. She's going to get up and testify, you know. And uh, he'd just critique her and talk bad about her. And here's brother so-and-so. And look at him, that hypocrite, that poor fool, you know. And uh, none of you would be doing that right now. But I'm just saying, you know, he was, he was, he was an angry, angry guy. And uh, one day he was listening. Sometimes it just happens to the best of us. You just find yourself listening. And he was listening instead of criticizing, and his heart was moved to respond to Jesus. And so he received Christ. He got born again. He said the wildest thing, he, it blew him away. He said the craziest thing happened to me. He said, I got to church, and old sister so-and-so stood up. He said, just something on the inside of me. He said, I, I love old sister so-and-so. He said, you know, really, and what happened was she had a really bad home life. Her husband was abusive, and, and, and he said, you know, she really is a good person. And then, brother so-and-so, and same thing happened, same thing happened. He said, all the people I used to hate, he said, something on the inside of me loved them. Why? Because he had been baptized into Christ. The old man passed away, and new man came. Jesus said, they will know you by your power. They will know you're my disciples. No, he didn't say that. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. He said, behold, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Oh, I wish you would have said, you'll glow in the dark and then they'll know you're my disciple. You'll have so much power, lightning shoots out of your fingers. Right? Miracle. No, love. Doesn't that just irritate you? <laughs> Love. In other words, I'm joking, but uh, the truth of the matter is, is that something is put in you. Come on, if he could stand and look in the face of the people that nailed him to the cross and say, Lord, they really don't know what they're doing. Go ahead and forgive them. Just don't hold this to their account. How many of you think he can put something on the inside of you that will carry you from this life into eternity? That it never weakens, it never fades. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own precious blood he entered the most holy place and he secured your permanent deliverance the Bible says when you receive him you're baptized into Christ you're born again so that's one baptism right and it references that many other places again we have only so much time but uh, number two there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit right this is a controversial one right it shouldn't be but I figure if the devil were smart he'd make what would help you controversial wouldn't it <laughs> He said, here, listen, don't fool with that. Don't do this. But, and then there's been a lot of error, right? How many of you ever seen anybody do anything weird in the name of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is standing over there like, listen, I have nothing to do with this. I am not involved in any way, shape, or form. I think, you know, some people are crazy. Even the devil's like, listen, I'm not doing that. That's not me. He don't even want credit for some of the stuff people do. No, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is very, very real, Right? And Jesus said, actually, Jesus commanded his disciples not to go anywhere until they receive this endowment of power from on high. And he said, you will receive power from on high. That word power is the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get dynamite. You know, there's more powerful things than dynamite nowadays, but... Uh, it doesn't just mean power, right? We think the Holy Ghost comes on us and, and we just, you know, uh, do crazy things. But actually, it means ability. You will receive ability from on high. Aren't you glad he didn't say you receive weirdness from on high? That's what a lot of people, whoa. You know, Jesus wasn't spooky. But he was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, the works I do, you're going to do also. Greater works than these. Because you're slick? No, not because you're slick. Because he's good. He said, if you believe in me, what I've done, you'll do, right? Amen. And, and I'm just saying that, that uh, it's a wonderful thing to look into the face of a person that, that's been healed and know you see all of those emotions of what it's like 
to be given your life back. I remember praying for a lady in Oklahoma. I was in Bible school. I started preaching probably before I should have started preaching. And I uh, thought I'd be better by now. But anyhow, uh, she, I prayed for her. I didn't realize the extent of her disease, but she had a disease. She couldn't eat solid food. And she had a fee. I didn't know under her shirt she had a feeding tube. That's the only way she was given nutrients. And uh, I prayed for, I mean, it wasn't because of me, because if you hear the whole story, uh, it's very interesting. But I remember I prayed for her. I never had a goosebump, right? The Holy Spirit doesn't just give goosebumps. Didn't have a goosebump. I didn't feel anything. But I prayed for her because I knew the Spirit of God empowered me. And she got healed instantly. After church, she ate cake, swallowed it. I didn't know that that was the first time in a long time. Now, you know the Lord moved a miracle when you eat cake, right? If she ate broccoli, it's up for debate. But cake, she ate cake. And that woman's countenance, she melted. Because the doctors, I didn't know. The doctor said she had to die. But Jesus said she could live, right? Boy, I'm telling you, the look on people's face when the Spirit of God empowers those things and then the other part of that story was that her son was there and he was mad at God because all the people in the church have been telling him that God's the reason why she's sick so he's mad at God and God's taken his mom from her from him then when he saw that Jesus was the healer his whole life changed he became one of the most dedicated people in church you couldn't keep him out of church See, the Holy Spirit, He's not strange. It doesn't have to make sense, right? How many of you know there's things that don't make sense? You don't even have to get into spiritual things for things not to make sense. You just get into physics. They say if you read Einstein's books, you know less about them after than you did before you read them. <laughs> you say, what just happened to me? But the Holy Spirit will empower you. So there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist says this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water. So he's making a distinction, right? Unto repentance. But, he said, there is one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now this is interesting because uh, historically it's believed that Jesus was possibly baptized. How many of you remember Jesus baptized in the River Jordan? Came a sound from heaven. Said, this is my beloved son. It's believed that he was baptized probably in January. January. How many of you know what the temperature of the Jordan River is in January? It's between 45 and 50 degrees. <laughs> so if you want to feel that to, tonight when you take a bath or a shower, just do that. 45, but then John, right in the middle of that cold river, says, but there's coming one after me. And there's a different river. It's a warm river. It's a river of fire. Isn't that interesting? Baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I believe that in Acts chapter 2, we have this account to show us this is the baptism John was referencing. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. So here's that fire. And then they were all, uh, uh, one sat upon each of them, right? So this is for everybody. One sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they spoke, but the Spirit gave them utterance. But then there's this thing of fire. There's a baptism in the Holy Spirit that happens after you're born again, after salvation. Jesus said it this way, you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. Your wineskin has to be made new. You must be born again. But the born again human spirit is created to receive this experience. And I'm just saying, I know there's a lot of personalities. People say, well, my personality's quiet. It's amazing that everybody's personality becomes the same when you get to church. Just quiet. But the funny thing is about it is that if you set a quiet person on fire, they're going to do things that normal people don't do, right? 
Oh, come on. You've, you've gotten too close to the barbecue. Right? No matter how conservative you are, if you like your eyebrows, you're going to... Ah! You jump back, right? There's something about the Holy Spirit that will empower your life, burn up all the stuff that would happen. And uh, think about it this way, that a fog can't hover when the sun comes out. The heat dissolves that fog. There's something about the fire of the Holy Spirit that will burn up all confusion, all fogginess and bring clarity of thought and life. In fact, some people's problem isn't a natural problem. You just need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Let that fire burn on the inside of you. Uh, the Bible calls Satan Beelzebub. And our pastor said if he was in the south, he'd be Beelzebubba. <laughs> right? The southern devil. Beelzebubba. Uh, but that just simply means Lord of the flies. In other words, he's the prince of all these other little how many of you like flies <laughs> I have all kinds of things my, my wife's dad gave me a bug assault you know it's a shotgun with salt in it and everybody needs one so anyhow uh, boy that's really fun you know you shoot flies you shoot mosquitoes and then even your kids so uh, <laughs> not me but you know I heard somebody had done that but uh, and then I have a, a, a little uh, tennis racket DC gave me a tennis racket I got all these things uh, that has electricity in it, right? So you, you smack the fly or your kids or whatever. Not really, I'm just joking. But the, the, the thing is, is that nobody really likes flies. What are they? They're, they're a nuisance. They're a disease carrier. They, they come and, and they just kind of hover. How many of you hate that feeling, just that fly buzzing around your head, right? Yeah. Because you know what they buzz around normally, right? You're like, I ain't that, you know. Uh, so the, the Bible refers to Satan as the Lord of the flies. In other words, he's the one that sends out these little things that buzz over you. And the fly is seen, but that's unseen. And somebody said it this way, that a fly will never land on a hot stove. In other words, when the fire's on, those things can never take place. They can never land. They can never accomplish what they came to do. So there's something about the fire of the Holy Spirit that stops certain things before they can even start and it, it's an enabling it's the spirit of God that enables humanity to go and produce results that confirm that Jesus is alive Christianity without power is a philosophy Christianity without power is a philosophy But Christianity boasts of a resurrection. And someone said it this way, that if, mir if Jesus is alive, miracles are not only possible still, they are probable. And it was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that empowered Jesus, went about doing good, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for uh, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And God was with him. Right? And so we see that Paul entered into Corinth. He said, I did not come to you with the wisdom of men's words, with eloquence of speech. Eloquence has never saved anyone. He said, I came to you in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God was sent to give witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is for all believers, right? And you don't have to be... Uh, uh, you can receive this experience uh, whether you've been water baptized or not, you know. Uh, let's look at that in Scripture. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. Peter's preaching in Cornelius' house. How many of you know this story? I hate to, you know, sometimes you just run out of time, so you jump right in the middle of, of a bunch of stories. But Peter was, uh, he was, uh, there was this man named Cornelius. He was an Italian, you know. He's a non-Jew. He's a Gentile. And he's a, he, he gave a lot. He prayed a lot. And then one day an angel appeared to him and said, I want you to send to Joppa and ask for a guy named Peter. He's going to tell you words by which you can be saved. So he sent. And while the people are coming from Cornelius' household, uh, Peter is hungry. Like you. <laughs> and what did he do? 
He's like, man, I really want to eat, but it has come to this. He went to the roof and prayed. So he's on the roof praying, and then he had a vision. And basically the Lord showed him that he was going to, uh, salvation was not just for Jews, but it was for all flesh. All flesh. And uh, then these people come, and the Holy Spirit told Peter, go with these people. Don't question it, because the Jew wasn't supposed to. So Peter followed the Holy Spirit. And here he's preaching. He's there, and Cornelius is like, listen, Peter, I, I'm, I'm, uh, my name's Cornelius. Thanks for coming to my house. I was praying. I saw an angel. And he said that uh, you're going to come and tell me words by which me and my household will be saved. So talk to me. So Peter began to preach the gospel to Cornelius and his household. Notice what happened. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who what? Who believed. Well, when you believe the gospel, you are born again. So they believed the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit fell on those who believed. Now, there may have been people there who didn't believe. And the Holy Spirit didn't fall on them, did he? He fell on those who did believe. He fell on those who believed. And uh, those of the circumcision who believed uh, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know that? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Peter said, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They got saved. They believed the gospel. They got saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, then water baptized. That's an interesting uh, way to do it, right? We have all of our rituals, but actually Jesus is after people's heart. Did you know you can go to heaven without being water baptized? Ask the man on the cross next to Jesus, right? How many of you know he didn't get baptized? Uh, he was there. He said uh, one of them's ridiculing Jesus. The other one said, hey, we're guilty. He's innocent. He said, Lord, remember me. Jesus looked at him and said, this day you will be with me in paradise. So that brings us to water baptism. We see salvation, new birth, baptism in the Holy Spirit. God wants you to be full of the Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. But then there's water baptism. So let's see what is water baptism. Water baptism uh, is a good example. is in Acts chapter, 30, uh, Acts chapter 8 verses uh, 34 through 40. And um, we know that John the Baptist baptized people. Jesus baptized people. Paul baptized people. Paul himself was baptized, right? Uh, but here's a good, good example. Gives us some uh, understanding. Acts chapter 8, verse 34 through 40. And Philip here is preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit said, go join yourself. Go to this place. Join yourself to this eunuch. The eunuch was reading Isaiah. He was reading some redemptive prophecies written in Isaiah. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? So Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, which is Isaiah 53, if you go back and read the rest of Acts chapter 8, beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? All right, he's getting ready to give the prerequisite for water baptism. What hinders me? In other words, why, why is there any reason for me not to get baptized in water right now? All right, here's what Philip said. If you believe with all your heart, you may. The prerequisite, in other words, if you get baptized with water but don't believe in Christ as Savior, then it does nothing for you. Right? Only Jesus' blood washes from sin, not water. And Jesus' blood leaves a permanent change, yet uh, not water, right? How I many of you keep taking baths? If not, we'll have a prayer line. Right? Impartation. In other words, you don't just take one bath and then you're good forever. It's regular. Baptism in water is a symbolic thing of an internal reality. He says, uh, 
if you believe with all your heart, you may. So what did the eunuch say? He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so they stopped the chariot. He was baptized. And here we see the prerequisite of being water baptized is to be born again or baptized into Christ. And notice he made a confession of Christ as his savior before he was water baptized. And so everybody getting baptized today has made that confession. It's called the great confession that Jesus is Lord. When you say Jesus is Lord, you say nothing else is, right? Without even having to say that. Because if Jesus is Lord, Satan isn't. If Jesus is Lord, fear isn't. If Jesus is Lord, sickness isn't. If Jesus is Lord, nothing is Lord. Only Jesus is Lord. And so this eunuch made that confession. And then he was baptized in water. And then when the two came up, Philip was translated. That sure beats paying for gas, right? Uh, He was translated. So water baptism doesn't save you, but it's an outward demonstration of an internal reality. Look with me in Romans chapter 6, and we see a little bit of the description, and then then we'll uh, pray and dismiss, all right? And we'll dismiss out. uh, I'll give you the instructions here in just a second. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not, right? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? That means it's possible to not know. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, what happened when you were baptized into Christ? The Bible says right here, you were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So water baptism, the third type of baptism we talk about today, is a demonstration of of what happened to you spiritually when you were born again. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 that it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now if you're a Christian, whether you feel that or not, you can say that. And the more you say it, you'll feel it. Right? So baptism in water is saying that I died with Christ, I was buried with him, but when he rose, I rose. It's a proclamation of the work of redemption in your life. Paul said, Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul said, when he died, I died, right? All of Galatians 2.20 says, I was crucified with Christ. So it didn't happen because Paul was there because Paul wasn't there. He didn't walk with Christ in his earth ministry. He actually persecuted the church when it began, but he was uh, encountered on the road to Damascus. He got born again. And then he says, when I received Christ, I died when he died. I was buried when he was buried and I was raised when he was raised. So we could say it this way, that water baptism is a reenactment of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ for you. And you know, really, ultimately, the temptation, which I won't, right? One Christian comedian said, uh, every preacher ought to be like Pharaoh and let God's people go, right? So, (laughs) but the temptation is to talk about the significance of you being in Christ because a large part of Christianity, right? Christianity isn't your passport to heaven. It's heaven's entrance into you on the earth. 
Over 130 times, Paul talks about who you are and what's happened to you in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. You have been seated with him in Christ in heavenly places. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's something about Jesus that when you died with him, were buried with him, and raised with him, the same life that Jesus came out of the grave with is communicated to your spirit. And that life will overwhelm any fear, any bondage, any addiction, any sin, any disease, anything that his substitutionary redemptive work has accomplished. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. That in him you will not go unchallenged, but you can go undefeated. That when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard against him. And baptism is a proclamation. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So when you think about it, like, it begins to work in your heart. That's really what meditation is. And then you might even be sitting at home and think, man, I was just thinking about a scripture and I started laughing. You ever think about what God did and just start laughing? If you see it for what, you're not going to get to heaven and be real, you know. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of people that get to heaven, they're like, oh my gosh, tone it down a little. (laughs) God's not like mellow, you know. The Bible says there's angels with eyes all the way around their head. And wheels within wheels and like face of a lion and wings and, and, and he's a fire from the waist up and the waist down. <clears throat> In your presence is fullness of joy. Pleasures forevermore. There's nothing sad about God. The Bible says of Jesus that he was anointed with the oil of gladness above all other people. Jesus had to be ridiculously happy. You know, all these movies, Jesus says, come out of that man, you little devil. No, the Bible said he'd stand up with a loud voice and shout. He preached, he taught, he laughed. And he did something eternally that will change your whole life. If we just begin to dwell on it, think on scripture. Don't think on opinions. Don't think on what somebody said. Think on the scriptures. Right? If the Bible... Now, God, I didn't say this. You said, if I'm seated with you in heavenly places, I'm a new creature in you, that means nothing from before is going to hold me and limit me or restrict me. Unlimited possibilities, right? We don't have time to talk about it. Listen, before we go, we're going to go outside and uh, we're going to all go out uh, to this direction which is my left, your right, as soon as we go out the door. When you go out the door, it'll be your left also. Uh, (laughs) But but for now, uh, I I just want to give anybody here or watching an opportunity. Uh, We never know where people are, right? I never know. I just always trust the Holy Spirit to speak to each heart because He knows where everybody is. I don't. So if you're here this morning, if you'd all just bow your head and close your eyes, give everybody here an opportunity, just be reverent. If you're watching online, if you're here, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you don't know that you have eternal life, if you don't know that you have confessed the great confession, we want to pray with you right now. If you're in this house, just raise your hands. We want to pray with you. Uh, We won't embarrass you. We just want to pray with you. Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? We're going to pray. If you're watching online, you've never confessed that Jesus is Lord. There is no greater thing. You might not like anything else I talked about, but the truth is that Jesus came to save sinners. And if you need to be set free, he will do that for you right now. Let's all say this for the sake of those who haven't.
If you're watching online, pray this with us from the bottom of your heart. It doesn't help to parrot something, but if you pray with us from the bottom of your heart, you mean it. Just like Philip told the eunuch, he said, if you believe with all your heart, that's how you receive. So say this with me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God, that you died for my sins, but I believe that you're not dead. I believe God raised you from the dead and I confess you as my Lord. I turn from all else to follow you. Hallelujah. If you prayed that for the first time, we want to help you begin your walk with God. Come talk to us. We want to answer your questions. Uh, if you need prayer for anything, we'll pray with you after the service. Um, God wants to... Uh, I love what Jesus said himself. He says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. There's nothing more important than that. So if you're watching online, you're here. We want to know about it if you prayed that for the first time. We're going to get ready and go baptize. So get everybody ready. Uh, like I said, take the young ones to the bathroom uh, just for the sake of others, you know. And, um, but we're going to baptize and everybody that is getting baptized has made a public profession of Christ. And so uh, based on that, we'll immerse them. And uh, if you weren't planning on getting baptized, but you want to, uh, there's no cutoff, right? So we'll, we, will, uh, we will baptize you. So uh, let's stand before we go. If you're here for the first time, you want a gift, then you can just fill out a card. If you're not here for the first time, then just look down, fill out a card, and trade it for a gift, all right? Uh, thank you for coming. Let me just pray over you real quick before we're dismissed. And then, like I said, there will be people out there that are going to direct you. We'll get everybody lined up for baptism. I'll be right on my way out there, and uh, we'll have a good time. So, Father, thank you so much for everybody here. Lord, you know where we're all at in our hearts and our lives. I pray that you minister to each one, strengthen each one, equip each one to do what you've called them to do. May they wake up even in the night to see clearly what you would have them hear and what you'd have them know. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you right outside.